bliss and heaven. Stanley Kubrick is one of the most prolific filmmakers of the last century, and one that I believe needs no introduction. So, I'm not going to give one. You're familiar with his work. Kubrick's style has become known colloquially as Kubrickian, so as a start, let's take a look at the official definition of the word Kubrickian, a catch-all term for a style and means of communication to his audience. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, Kubrickian refers to the of or relating to Stanley Kubrick, resembling or characteristic of his films. Kubrick is particularly noted for his meticulous perfectionism, mastery of the technical aspects of filmmaking, and for an atmospheric visual style of films across a range of genres. Okay, that tells us almost nothing. So, let's instead focus more on what I can argue Kubrick uses in his films regularly. It's no secret that Kubrick enjoys using irony in his films. It allows him to play with our expectations, whether it be for comedic, Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room! Or dramatic effect. During the winter, he must have suffered some kind of a complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and, uh... <laughs> he killed his family with an axe. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not gonna happen with me. And while Kubrick uses it in the traditional sense of taking story beats and contrasting it with our expectations, Kubrick also employs it in a way that is similar to what is known as the Kuleshov effect. In editing, there's a technique referred to as the Kuleshov effect, a theory and phenomenon that by taking two different shots and pairing them together, new feelings and meaning can be derived. Here, we see a man looking hungrily at a bowl of soup. Or is he gazing lustfully at a woman sleeping? Or is he saddened over the death of a child? Anyways, the answer is none of these things, because none of them are actually related. However, the pairing of them together makes them mean more than they do independently. Or, in other words, creates new meaning. Kubrick is using a similar technique with his scenes and the music he chooses to underscore them with, creating irony and giving the music a rhetorical purpose. No film in his repertoire embodies this more than his 1971 film, A Clockwork Orange. A dystopian crime film about a horrible criminal that is taken in and given an experimental procedure that strips away his negative attributes and enables him to return to society as a morally upstanding citizen. I would argue, and this film uses this to an immense extent, that one of the more fun Kubrickian genre conventions is that music is used both diegetically and non-diegetically, and both rhetorically and ironically. Commonly, music serves to only enhance what is already going on on screen non-diegetically. Sad music plays over sad scenes, happy music over happy, and the more gung-ho variety over action adventure. <laughs> Taking this into consideration, the pathos of a film can be enhanced through a pairing of the visual and the audio. Often, musical themes are tied to characters and their actions. This appears in Clockwork Orange as well. The various musical pieces worked throughout the film function as themes for the actions Alex and his droogies commit, as well as their mental state at the time. Rossini's The Thieving Magpie Overture and the William Tell Overture appears when Alex is up to no good. Leave the hell alone, don't touch it! It's a very important work of art! Beethoven is used when Alex is inspired and fantasizing about his own version of heaven. When he is with his droogies and narrating, we are given the electronic, er, futuristic version of Purcell's dirge music for the funeral of Queen Mary. This non-diegetic use of music is traditional, but as subverted and ironic as our anti-hero. Untraditionally, Kubrick is able to add a layer of irony to his scenes with the use of music. Where new meaning can be derived, however, is by using previously established pieces of music in the scene and messing with the audience's assumptions and previous associations. He was one of the first to use music this way, and Tarantino, Edgar Wright, and so many other filmmakers owe him a debt. Here I am, stuck in 
by using pieces of music with built-in audience associations, Kubrick is able to use those cultural expectations and create new meaning by turning them on their head. The best example of this in A Clockwork Orange is his use of singing in the rain. <laughs> Singing in the Rain is one of the most famous pieces of music ever used in film. Everyone relates the song as an expression of unrestrained joy and a declaration of happiness and love. The images of Gene Kelly dancing a soft shoe with his umbrella as a cane are iconic. I'm happy again. Alex's use of the song subverts all of the audience's associations and replaces them with unrestrained violence, rape, cruelty, and indifference to humanity. All the while, Alex does the gleeful soft shoe and cane dance routine. It's disconnected and disturbing. However, in an added Kubrickian twist, Alex is not acting ironically at all. He is doing what makes him the happiness and expressing his own joy as sadistic and cruel as it is. He sings the song twice in the film. The second time is when he is finally safe, under the care of a kind gentleman, and beginning to feel hopeful that he may become finally happy again. Ironically, and yes, we all know how a humble filmmaker loves his irony, Alex is singing his happy song, which brings about events that lead him to attempting suicide, of course. But ultimately, and in another ironic twist, to his salvation. Alex is saved, returned to his previous state, and the film ends with Alex gleefully enjoying violence and sex while listening to Beethoven's Ninth, the government and media applauding and backing him fully. The credits roll to Gene Kelly's Singing in the Rain, and this is the confirmation for the audience that the ultra-violent Alex is finally happy again. He's back, leaving the audience in an uncomfortable place in their new associations with the song and the resolution of the story. The happy ending is a violent, dangerous rapist will be returning to his old ways. The message and the music are profoundly dislocating the audience, in a way that's entirely new. This both profoundly alters the song's meaning and the audience's association of both the song and what a happy ending is. But to really understand what is going on here, we have to look at what classical music means to us as a society. Kubrick deliberately messes with the audience's assumptions of class and its connection to classical music. Traditionally, classical music is meant to inspire and bring about, for lack of a better term, a well-to-do-ness that the sophisticated revel in. A plane of higher intellectual and moral status that comes with a certain kind of aesthetic. Want to immediately show your audience that your character or setting is sophisticated by any means? Underscore the scene with classical music. Is there a problem? You're Abe Froman. That's right. I'm Abe Froman. The sausage king of Chicago. Yeah, that's me. Alex is clearly of the lower class, the British working class specifically, and yet he is outraged and offended when he stumbles upon a bum singing a common working class Irish ditty, Molly Malone. For this offense to Alex's musical sensibilities, Alex and his droogies beat the bum. The unexpected pairing of Alex's appreciation for good music and his distaste for the low-class common music is traditionally the inverse of the audience's expectations and the story conventions. So, which of these moral traits associated with classical music does Alex possess? The answer is none. None at least in a classical sense. Alex is a thug. He brutalizes, he rapes, and he revels in all of it. Alex represents, from a societal perspective, everything that classical music is not. Despite this, Alex views himself as the sophisticated intellectualist that we generally associate it with. And what unique, horrible meaning could Alex be deriving from his beloved Ludwig van? For Alex, it's the same kind of divine inspiration a great saint would attain. Alex, when uncertain about what to do or how to act, he derives violent inspiration through pieces of traditionally morally uplifting and joyful classical music, specifically Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. During the Ludovico technique, Alex is tortured to the music he loves most and receives his divine inspiration from. Now, his love of classical music and his newfound intrigue in Christianity is what got him selected for this treatment. But when it's being taken from him, there's not much resistance to the idea. It's just an unpleasant side effect we get from his anti-violent conditioning. Stop it! Stop it! Please! I beg you! Can't be helped. Ironically, yes, again, because Alex gets his violent fantasies and impulses from Beethoven, it is precisely the thing that should be exercised from Alex. The association of moral uplift of classical music is so complete to the audience that this is often overlooked. We should be cheering that this is being taken from him, but the audience is saddened instead. 
And just when you think it couldn't get even more subverted and ironic, let's take a look at the film as a whole and the role music plays in it. Let's get a meta-analysis of what's going on so we can understand why Kubrick is doing the things he is doing. Music is the matrix that holds the story together. The story overall is a tripartite structure. 1. Alex lives and he is guided by Beethoven and Beethoven's works inspire his actions. 2. Betrayed by his droogies, his disciples. Alex is tortured by the government and is crucified. Alex is reborn and walks through his old life visiting the people he knew. And finally, 3. Alex is resurrected and reunited with his divinity, Beethoven, and able to enter heaven through communicating with music once again. He has attained salvation and now once again sits at the right hand of his god, Ludwig van. Kubrick gives the ultimate irony of the most famous story in the world. Clockwork Orange is an ironic Christian allegory. Alex is Christ, Beethoven is God, music is religion, the government are the Romans, his droogies are his disciples. Music isn't just a soundtrack, but a character. Beethoven isn't just a composer or a character, he is the creator, which makes Alex the biggest anti-hero in the history of anti-heroes. How's that for subversion irony? Are we, are we happy with that? Because it's basic Kubrickian genre logic. Everything is ironic and subverted in meaning. It's a no small wonder why audiences, critics, and censors at the time found the movie so unsettling, disturbing, and profoundly offensive. Whether they recognized the Christ story or not, they had to feel something was deeply wrong. It was rated X initially, it was banned in several places, and it was feared the film would unleash violence. Ultimately, Stanley Kubrick withdrew the film from the UK, and it remained banned there until his death. However, his films continue to explore human violence, sexual depravity, and yet, this is the film he withdrew. He feared the effects of it on audiences. The film was the sole film that subverted the Christ story and perhaps was even too ironic and too subverted for Kubrick himself, whether the audience caught it or not. And of course, perhaps it was penance as he was just waiting to meet his maker. Since it was released again upon his death, wouldn't that be ironic? Singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. I'm laughing at clouds so dark. 